The 540 is brought to you by StarCityGames.com Weekly Sale. Go to StarCityGames.com slash sale because this week, do we have the promotion for you. From now until Monday, August 2nd at 10.59 a.m., we have decided that you deserve a bonus. So everything you purchase on StarCityGames.com will pay you 10% back in bonus bucks. That means store credit site-wide for every single purchase. Spend $100 on Magic Singles for your cube? Guess what? 10% back in store credit. Want to get a whole slew of sleeves for all of your Commander decks? 10% back of that in store credit. Now until Monday, August 2nd at 10.59 a.m., head over to StarCityGames.com, get to spending, and get those bonus bucks. The 540 is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design. If you want to get the coolest magic t-shirts and hoodies and stickers, go to coalesceapparel.shop. And if you find something you like, use gift code SCG to save 10% off at checkout. That's coalesceapparel.shop. Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. What's up, everybody? Cedric Phillips here, stopping by real quick to let you know about one of Star City Games' newest podcasts, The Receivables, hosted by yours truly, alongside my partner in crime, of course, Patrick Sullivan, where the two of us discuss magic sets, both past and present, from top to bottom. On every episode of The Receivables, you're going to hear us talk about the facts of a set, the mechanics of a set, the cycles of a set, you know, the boring stuff, before we get into some crazy stories of when we were playing magic during the times that the set was legal. Uh, we've got a ridiculous award show where we give out awards like the Char Rumbler Award for Weirdest Card in a Set, the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for Best Card in the Set, and a whole bunch more. Before we finally decide, hey, what card won the set and what letter grade should we give the set? It's a whole lot of fun. We're having a blast recording them. Hopefully you have the opportunity to listen to it and you enjoy it as much as we're enjoying recording them. Where can you find it? StarCityGames.com or wherever else you listen to your podcast. The Receivables every single week here at SCG. Welcome back, everyone, to the 540, where we are talking about drafting cubes, just like we did last week. We were talking about finding your lane last week, and this week we are talking about how to make your draft work once you have found that lane. I am Justin Parnell. You can find me at jparnell1 on Twitter, and of course, my co-host with the mohost. <laughs> just just go with it. It's fine. I, I am Ryan over turf. And yeah, I'm just here to go with it. I think that's an appropriate uh, an appropriate thing for today's episode is just going with it. Because oftentimes, uh, you know, a, a, a cube draft often has a, a mind of its own uh, <laughs> and can try to pull you in a variety of different directions. And it is our job. And your job as a drafter to try to identify the times when you should go with the flow of the draft, or maybe sometimes you should go against the flow of the draft. Say, no, draft, I don't want to draft mono white. I want to draft this four color good stuff deck that Ryan always calls four color bad stuff. Hold on, hold on. Those are two disparate archetypes, Justin. Look, four color bad stuff is actually the kind of draft that you will end up in if you don't heed the advice of the podcast. (laughs) <laughs> what we are trying to convey is the information that will allow you to draft a coherent deck, be it mono white aggro or be it four color good stuff. And I think that's actually where I see the most lopsided matches in cubes, even in powered cubes. There is some stuff like Soul Ring, obviously Black Lotus, blah, 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 Oko that can take over a game with single cards. But if the game lasts five or six turns where you see the most disparity and where one deck is the most favored over the other is because that deck has a coherent plan. It's a deck. It's a deck yes. versus a pile of 40 cards. Yes. And and you can, and while it is less likely just because of the nature of drafting, it is possible for that distinction to lie on the favorable side of the four-color deck. Yeah, that definitely no, that, can happen. 
It happens less often, but when you have identified your lane and the plan for your draft, I think that that is when you can start having successful drafts that are maybe outside of the the box and especially outside of a one or two color deck. Mm-hmm. No, we're not specifically talking about multicolor decks today, so I don't want to. I, I brought that up as a joke. I don't want to like <laughs> lead us down a, uh, this this path that we're not intending to go on. Yeah, it does have some interesting examples to pull from. You know, there's a huge difference between a deck that is really dedicated to doing Omnath Locus of Creation things mm-hmm. and a deck that has 14th pick black white cards and 14th pick gruel cards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 14th pick gruel cards are generally never where you want to be. <laughs> no. If you didn't. If you didn't pick those early in the draft and no one else did, it's probably just not going to be a thing that anyone's going to be interested in doing. But, okay, so last week we were, like I had said, we talked about finding your lane, which is really like identifying what you are wanting to draft or what you perhaps should be drafting based on what the, you know, the signals you're reading or what the cube might be feeding you uh, by virtue of having you open very powerful cards in uh, certain colors or decks. So this week, we kind of want to talk about like, well, what happens? What happens then? You've you've found what you're going to be drafting. You're in the middle of the draft. Hopefully you uh, have have not paused the draft long enough to listen to both of these episodes in real time, because seven days is a really long time to wait for for a bunch of other people while you waited for the second episode to come. out. (laughs) I don't know how I human being could have a patience for something like that <laughs> probably not uh i don't know maybe maybe your friends are just really all into cube drafting it's like hey why don't we we're, we're halfway through pack one we've now all agreed that we want to wait for the next episode of the 540 to come out before continuing this draft <laughs> you know you got one of those big tables everyone everyone just sets down their packs working with the honor system it's like all right we'll just wait uh Huh. Till we can listen to this. You know, I had the thought never crossed my mind. I, I wonder if there are draft groups that just listen to the pod while they while they do their cubes. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine that at some point in the future that will hopefully happen. I get told all the time, like uh, a lot, that people play Commander while like having Commander verses on in the background. That happens a lot. I hear about that very frequently. I don't see why not. I don't see why you wouldn't listen to the 540 while you're cubing. Yeah, I'm going to start doing it. Yeah, no, it's way more weird for you. <laughs> okay, uh, that's unless fair. you're like, unless you're like, yeah, this, this, there's this, this advice is just terrible. We just say the worst shit on the podcast. Don't listen to any of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, just a way to uh, grief the players, let them know who runs things. Kind of like how when I started <laughs> running Spooky Cube drafts, I would play the Monster Mash on repeat. Oh, God. Just on repeat? Well, how I, long is that song? I would do that when uh, one match was still going and everyone else was done. I would just sit next to them, turn my phone on full volume, and play the Monster Mash. Oh, God. Yeah, that's rough. That's, that's, a, that's a tough go of it. It was a good bit. Yeah. Okay, so... Monster Mash aside, uh, listening to the podcast aside, which is pretty much, you know, that's that's really all that we had to talk about today. So we're just going to wing it for the rest of the way <laughs> now. Uh, OK, so one thing that is 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 going to be very important is is when you are sitting down to draft or maybe when you're in the, the midst of the early parts of the draft. How can you identify the metagame of the draft? Because there's a lot of different factors that go into this. It's not just, well, what does the what does the cube what does the cube look like? Because this is the kind of questions you could ask yourself when you are doing any sort of draft. Doing if you're doing like an Avengers in the Forgotten Realm draft, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're roughly all of the cards are gonna have the same amount of colors and there's gonna be the same, you know, everything is gonna be evenly distributed. But there's often there's like kind of bigger questions that you can ask that have an impact on the draft that is the overall metagame of the event that you're playing. Definitely. And that was actually a pretty big disparity when I was writing about modern a lot and playing modern a lot. The way that the average player talks about metagame, they tend to mean the literal decks I'm going to play against. When they want to play at their LGS, they say, what's the meta like? And they're asking, 
do I need cyborg cards for burn specifically? Where when like I approach a modern tournament, I am making sure I have efficient tools for a broad range of things. The meta game that is the modern format, broadly speaking, and for cube meta games, a little bit closer to that is what you're looking for. You're asking yourself, what are the absolute most powerful cards on what turn? Do I have to really have my engine going so I'm not left in the dust by the kind of decks I expect to play against? How much interaction is in the cube? That's a big meta game factor. You know, if I'm trying to be, play a beatdown deck and there's a ton of one for one removal, if that's what the metagame is, then I know that my beatdown deck has to be able to make up that value or try to be able to fight over these one for ones. Or if the situation is the metagame is heavy on sweepers, anger of the gods, wrath of God. So my aggressive deck to compete then has to have planeswalkers or indestructible creatures or, or things of that nature, or it impacts the way I want to play my deck. And decks that play differently will certainly value things differently in the draft because you generally want different cards. So it's all the things that you expect to happen over a sample of games if you were to draft that deck and play enough in the cube. Yeah, and or really any deck. I think a good thing that you said is like, you know, is this a cube where when I draft something, I get to kind of do the thing that I'm trying to do? Does everyone get to do the thing that they're trying to do? Because it's a lot of cards that are uh maybe i don't want to say like light on interaction but the point the goal of the cube is to let people kind of like build their machines and then ram them into each other to see which one is stronger rather than uh trying to do this delicate dance of threat and removal threat and removal until somebody runs out of cards mm -hmm. and I, those are two very different type of cubes and i've i've played as i'm sure a lot of people that have played multiple different kind of cubes you have probably played both and all, you know on either end of the spectrum and a lot in between yeah, definitely. And the amount of interaction in a cube that's going to impact what a control deck looks like if you expect to play against a control deck at all. Um, one of the cubes I played against recently was my friend literally calls it the solitaire tubert. And yeah. you're, you're just not going to draft a control deck. It's just not going to happen. So when you draft, you're not really making hedges expecting to play against that. And you're certainly not drafting as if that's what you're going to build. Yeah, I think another good example of that, uh, this is probably the most obvious example, is uh, Dave McDarby's Live the Dream Cube. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, you're, it's literally in the title, right? You're trying to live the dream by doing this, whatever this thing is. Uh, and most people are trying to do whatever their thing is in the draft. And the, the most cohesive game plan often wins rather than uh, the most points of interaction. Yes. Yeah, so some interaction is good. Um, but it typically is stapled on to something that advances your game plan um, in that cube and also in McDarby's Chromatic Cube on Magic Arena. The, the five, the mana drain adjacent card, what's, what's the spell swindle? I think it is the five mana counter spell, spell where you get yeah, treasures. That, treasures. that yeah. card is like one of the best points of interaction in that cube because it stifles the opponent and gives you the mana to go off yourself. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, for that cube, look, mana drain might cost five, but it's still mana drain at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so for for drafting, uh, you when when you're when you are trying to identify the meta game, that is something that can be difficult if you have not, I guess, experienced a cube before. Uh, that that's that's something that is very tricky if it's the first time that you are drafting. A singular cube because you unless you have like you know looked over the list or talked to the cube designer you're kind of going to be feeling things out in the middle of the cube and sometimes you can do that but i would imagine uh the people that have a lot of experience doing that are kind of kind of go by their own experience uh and it's going to be very format dependent because you know if you have a friend that has a cube or maybe you just draft you know, a certain online cube very frequently, you're going to know what that is, but, uh, or you're going to know kind of what to expect in that scenario. But in a lot of other times when you're drafting a new cube, that's incredibly difficult. Yep. And just knowing a lot of historically powerful cards or the general cube staples, uh, having a good idea what those cards are, be they the nuts and bolts stuff, Ponder, Lightning Bolt, Thoughtseize, Llanowar Elves, just cards that you would really play in any deck. Thraben Inspector, I suppose I should name a white one, 
just just cards that are generally going to make decks of those colors or the high impact ones. You know, usually if Wrath of God's in a cube, it's probably pretty good. Your Sublime Epiphanies, got to shout out Sublime Epiphany. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you can't go too wrong in drafting cards of that nature. Yeah. Where you're going to really struggle if you've never seen a cube before is if you've never heard of a cube like it. Um, I, I <laughs> yeah. think that might, might, I've drafted that Solitaire cube twice and those are some of the worst decks I've ever drafted in any environment in my life. <laughs> sure. Uh, two notes here. Uh, 12 minutes and 43 second mark until Reinman. Sublime Epiphany. And, <laughs> and two, I would say in most cases that you're not, the, the, the cubes that are like wildly different than everything else, most of the time, a cube owner will give you the rundown. They're not going to be like, hey, do you want to draft my cube? And then you open up your first pack and you're like, what is what is happening? <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Do you want me so, to beat you at this game I invented for an hour yeah, or two? <laughs> exactly. Um, but that you know, you you bring up uh, you bring up a tubert as you know. Uh, I, I don't I don't even keep count on on saying the word tubert anymore. Um, <laughs> for when that happens in the podcast, but you know, but a lot of a lot of what we were talking about last week was I would say primarily like six to eight person drafts. Um, and I would say we, I, most of the advice that I was giving, I was really thinking about as more of an eight person draft than anything else. But, you know, we do realize there are two person drafts, there's four person drafts, there's six person drafts, there's 10 person drafts, 12 person drafts. Mm -hmm. I have done, I have done a number of each of those. So that is a, that is a huge, massive, massive identifying uh, factor for what the metagame of the cube is ultimately going to be because when you have a smaller number of people well let me try to approach this from a different thing I was going to say smaller number of people but when you have a cube that is designed to fit a larger number of people so let's say you have a 540 card cube uh, as is the name of the show the only true size for a cube as everyone <laughs> would tell you uh, you have a 540 card cube, but you're only drafting with with four people total. It is going to be more difficult to pull off uh, more specific archetypes and they're going to be kind of general good cards. And in in those type situations, drafting the best card, which is the thing that I outlined uh, last week more heavily, is something that is going to give you the most success by a pretty significant margin mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the other way, if you're drafting a 540 card cube with 10 people where you're drafting almost the entire cube, you're going to really get a chance to see the the full gamut of every card that is appearing. And you might actually be able to draft a really specific archetype because you're going to have a, a group of a massive number of cards by virtue of 10 people opening three packs of potentially 15 cards each. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something to think about. Like, what am I going to have access to? How creative can I get when I get into this draft based on how many cards I'm going to see? Yeah, and that's just a huge difference. If you're talking about a 540 card cube, the more players you have, like you said, the more likely you're going to see the card you want. If it's the kind of card people pass, you know, somebody is more likely to get the card. If you have yes. a 360 card powered cube, you know somebody at the table has Black Lotus and you know it's in somebody's deck. And then other things change, like there's some two card combos that change a lot contextually when you're drafting every card in the cube. Your Splinter Twins, your Yawgmoth's Will, Lion's Eye Diamond, you know that this stuff is all involved. Where when you have a 540 or even 360 card cube and you draft with four players, Mm -hmm. You just need to take cards that function and lands that produce mana. And if your deck is casting spells yeah. on turns, like if, you, if your deck is functioning along the core tenets of magic, you will often outperform the average four-player draft deck in an environment where you're drafting you know, a small section of the cube. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and, and that, is really, that is really like a, a core competency is all of the cards are going to be good. So you don't have to worry as much in those situations, especially like the ones that Ryan outlined, is do I have to worry about uh, if, if this card doesn't exactly fit what I'm doing? Well, in 360 card cube, um, there's not much that doesn't deserve to be there. Probably close to none. 
none of the cards uh, are kind of fall into the category of should this be in this cube or not? Because then you're talking about if it's even if it's not a vintage cube, even if it's just a 360 card cube of a different variety, it is going to be the 360 cards that are identified as the most powerful or the most apt for whatever the cube is trying to accomplish. So there's going to be very little that you're going to be in a bad place if you have, as long as you can cast your spells on time and and cast them, uh, you know, with an appropriate mana base to do so. So, right. yeah, you're. I, I always feel like that. That is, that, but that's just a huge, you know, a huge thing to keep in mind because I have gone in and I have done smaller drafts with a a larger cube. But you know, even doing a six man draft with a seven hundred twenty card cube, that's exactly half of the cube. That's akin to doing a, a 180 or excuse me, a four person draft with a 360 cube, which is kind of what we're talking about. But there's a much wider gap in the best card in a 720 card cube and the worst card in a 720 card cube. And you're not guaranteed to see all the best ones. Right. So those are those are just things you need to keep keep in context. How close am I? Maybe the question is, how close are we? How close is our pod to filling up the appropriate amount of the average drafters that this cube normally holds? And the farther away you are, the 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 more, uh, I guess I want to, uh, maybe the more basic is the way uh, to do it, to have a successful deck is, mm. uh, in my opinion, of, of the angle you should take. And just to tie that back into why that is a sub point about the metagame is when you're drafting with players where you draft more of the card pool than the metagame is different because players are drafting archetypes, getting their archetype specific cards decks should have some synergies they have cohesive things going on the four player environment is going to be a lot more 40 card piles of cards and if you are just casting something that has some ability to win the game creatures with power and toughness have some amount of interaction you will outperform decks that attempted synergies and didn't get them yeah yeah that's a good way to put it that's a good way to put it uh yeah it's and that's what i mean like you know be more it and basic is not bad i think people i think people think that you know basic straightforward decks are bad but as we have talked about on this on this show before like a lot of our uh you know the strategies that we that ryan and i often independently go to for success in the online cubes where it's not I don't want to say it's not as much about fun, but it is more about winning because it's not like an actual, you know, you're sitting down in seven other people environment. Um, the the decks that we often talk about are generally very basic decks from a mm-hmm. conceptual standpoint. So it's not necess- it's not a bad thing for that to be in the back of your mind because look, you could it's great to draft a deck and you're like, oh, I've got like I got three colors and I'm splashing this other color and I got you know, planeswalkers all over the place, and the deck looks really good on paper. And then when you go O three, you're going to have a lot less fun than you did right after the draft. <laughs> Usually, yeah. So, uh, anyway, the last thing I kind of want to talk about in 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 the identifying the draft of the game is forcing an archetype, like pre draft or maybe early on in the draft, just narrowing in on a specific archetype and saying, I'm just going to go out of my way to draft all of the components of this archetype, regardless of where I see them in the draft. Uh, This is something that I think in most cases, you have to be pretty familiar with a cube to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's something that is a high risk and high reward. but I don't, I'm trying to, I, this is tricky because it's like, should, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm not talking about this from a suggesting that you do, that you do this standpoint, uh, but just kind of laying it out as an option. It's something that um, when I'm drafting people's cubes for a, not the first time, but usually like a short time after that, like a second or third time after I've kind of figured out what the archetypes are. Sometimes I will just pick one and be like, you know, I want to draft this. I want to draft this like red green lands deck that you have in this cube. So I'll aggressively target all of the cards in those two colors that have to do with red green lands. And, you know, again, 
that's something you have to keep in mind with the uh, the disparity between the number of cards that you're going to see versus the number of cards that are in the entire cube. So that would be a bad strategy if I'm doing a six person draft of a 720 card cube because it could just completely fall on its face. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are doing an eight man draft of a 360 card cube, I think that 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 forcing an archetype is something that you can do with a lot more success. Uh, and the only downside to doing that is if someone is has latched onto that archetype early in the draft and is trying to fight you on that same axis. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, I actually think that that can be a very successful strategy when you're close to the max or at the max of drafting the entire cube and knowing what the valuable cards are in that archetype and knowing that you can draft those to free up the more valuable ones that might be coming later in the draft that maybe haven't been open in pack two or pack three yet uh, and making sure that you're clearing everyone out of even the thought of drafting those cards. Yeah, the, the more of the cube you're drafting, the more live you are to successfully force an archetype because then it's not the question of if the cards are open, it's the question of if they get to you. And if you're not passing the cards for that deck, good chance that uh, at least pack two you get them and you'll probably have figured something else out if you're not seeing the cards in pack one because it's pretty hard to force if you don't have any cards for an archetype um so drafting more of the cube making sure you actually get the pack the uh, pick two three four five six cards for the archetype and then another thing about forcing i imagine that i have force archetypes a bit more than you uh it's certainly based off of our discussion last week but uh, there's another big metagame concern there where if you try to force an archetype and it's very specific and you need this card, that card, a very specific thing would be like Storm with Lion's Eye Diamond Yakmas will. If you don't hit mm -hmm. exactly Storm, you have so many cards that only work for one deck. Literally. Right. Literally exactly one deck and not even sometimes. Right, exactly. Uh, it's a better idea to have multiple archetypes where... There is a specific nature of card that is something that you would pick early if you were forcing it, and then if you see certain pieces, it'll go towards one archetype. If you see different pieces, it goes toward another. The example I'm thinking of in the Magic Online Vintage Cube, two decks I really like, and I've tweeted some of this over the weekend. I like Sultai Playables, which is just one mana mana creatures, three mana stuff like Leovold, Oko, Ashiok, Grist is a big addition for that deck. And you just try to cast one of those on turn two. You have cards like Tireless Tracker. And then you have some four and five mana stuff. It's typically interactive. Your Vencers, maybe you get like a Counterspell, Thoughtseize. And it's just good Sultai cards. But you're also really highly picking cards like Noble Hierarch, Birds of Paradise, because they're what make the deck work. And if you pack one, pick one, scoop up a Mana Dork, and then pack one, pick two, you get past like a Gaia's Cradle or a Fellows, then you're also open to force like another of my favorite archetypes, which is just the mono green ramp deck, ideally looking for Crater of Behemoth. So finding overlapping cards you can pick early that you know that you're going to want for multiple archetypes, and then keeping an eye out for the win conditions or the uh, other cards that actually push you into one of the specific archetypes in the lane that you're forcing yourself into. Now, you were like, you said, I think I probably draft, you know, force more archetypes than you. And that's true. I just want to call back to last week when you're like, you know, if I end up with a, you know, a goblin god and a ponder, I might just play that. Um, I feel like that that's something that happens quite frequently. Again, <laughs> you're, 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 you called out the goblin guide and ponder deck as something that was like a wild hair that you're like, yeah, every once in a while I'd treat myself. Uh, I just, you know, I think, I think that we, I think uh, know the is it, I think the is it decks I subconsciously force because it's always something that happens where I end up in a blue red deck and I, I feel like I'm being deliberate and I just ended up here. <laughs> you ended up in a blue red deck. Uh, I don't know how it happened again. <laughs> yeah. I have oh, Auron's okay, Epiphany God. and Lightning Bolt, and, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is just my biases at work that that's, that's just true. Yeah, that's I mean, I, I'll draft a, a dumpy black green deck in my sleep. I don't even like it anymore. <laughs> it's like now it's like one of my when I end up and I'm like, ah, oh, God, I was like, I liked all these cards individually. But this deck is just like the average mana cost is like three point six. So 
Uh, that's the opposite of forcing an archetype. That should be me forcing myself away from an archetype is what I should try to do. But <laughs> anyway, um, but I, in all seriousness, I do, I do think that that is some very good advice. And you, you have to be, <laughs> you, you have to commit. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you are like, you know, if you get in and you're like, uh, no, I want to try to switch to something like a little more, uh, a little more open ended, um, you know, in like halfway through pack two, you have you have spent a lot of the most important picks on the draft on on a thing that you are or it might be forsaking. <laughs> um, and, and that is a very dangerous position to put yourself in. Yeah, forcing typically means picking highly cards that have high opportunity costs or for very yeah. specific context. That's yes. why you like the fetch lands early. That's why you like the ponders early because you it's can true. play them in a lot of decks. If you pack one, pick one crater of behemoth, I guess as long as you make green mana, you can cast it. But if it's only pumping plus one, plus one, you're in trouble. Yeah, you're probably in very, very big trouble. So, yeah, but that is, I mean, that is a type, but the crater of behemoth, in a card that has a lot of banner dorks, that is, if I'm like, I'm going to draft green ramp, that is a card that I could potentially, you know, pick that early. If that's, yeah. if there's two green cards in that pack, and one of them is like Balaged Recovery, and the other one's Crater Hope Behemoth, Balaged Recovery, I might play in a greater percentage of decks, but Crater Hope Behemoth is going to be the card that I want to play in the specific deck that's going to be the most, you know, one of the most impactful cards in that deck, so I'm just going to draft it. Mm -hmm. and just figure out the rest later everything that makes green mana that that can also attack as a creature draft all those doesn't matter the order just get them all yep just put them all in there try to get the crater of behemoth out look for other cards that are redundant on that and don't look back uh, to your greater yeah. point once you start forcing you know it's pretty early you have to abandon ship but you have to commit one way or the other and I, I think it's really early. Yes, it, it's like yeah. pack one, pick four. If yes, it looks like it's, it's not going to happen, that's when you have to get out. Exactly. Yeah, you can. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think you can like throw away your first three picks, which is not a great position to be in. But it's you know you can still put you can still put together a competent deck. Sure, it's cube. All of the cards are good. But uh, you know the first three picks, as I talked about last week, regardless. And this is the regardless of, you know, the size of the cube or how many other drafters there are. The first three picks are going to be, you know, three of the most valuable picks that's going to define the rest of your draft. So you have to be really careful when you're when you're trying to force and you're like, oh, this isn't going to work. Uh, you got to I don't know. It's tough, tough decision making early in the draft for for deciding when to do that or deciding when you have this when you don't want to do that anymore. The worst drafts that you will ever have, I'll, I'll call them will they, won't they drafts. If you start <laughs> forcing, but then you take a step back because, oh, I don't think that the two mana mana creature is the best thing for the deck, so I'm going to take this other card and try to stay open, but then you jump back and forth between taking a card that's specifically good in the deck that your pack one pick one would have forced or something to stay flexible. You're just going to have two decks one of which is a bunch of specific stuff that you didn't get because you were moving yeah. in and staying open. And the other one is all the stuff to stay open. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. At the end of the draft, you'll look like you have like two bad sealed pools. <laughs> <laughs> that generally doesn't work out. So broad point there. One way or the other, you got to commit. Yeah, you have to commit. That's true. All right. Uh, I think it is time for our first commercial break as we are required by law to do and by law i mean cedric so uh we're gonna take a quick break and be back in just a minute listen up gamers i have some huge news if you haven't heard the seg tour online is back and we're giving away cash prizes 
tens of thousands of MTG Arena gems, MTG Arena qualifier weekend invitations, MTG Arena championship invitations, and the big one, Star City Games Invitational Invitations. You heard that right, the Invitational is back. And that's gonna be at SCGCon. SCGCon is back, taking place Halloween weekend, that's October 29th through the 31st, in the Star City, that's Roanoke, Virginia. And you can qualify for the Star City Games Invitational via the SEG Tour online. Stay tuned for more details on that. Those will be coming soon. And for more information on the SEG Tour online, head over to scgtouronline.starcitygames.com. Now back to the pod. All right. So, you know, we've talked about identifying the greater metagame for the draft, but I kind of want to now get into more of the specific cards and, and maybe more appropriately, the roles that specific cards have in a draft or will serve for the purposes of the deck that you're trying to put together. Sure. Yeah, I think that a really big point on that line, once you have the metagame identified, there's usually one kind of card for every deck that you'll take as much of as you can get. For, for blue decks in most formats, that's often going to be, well, blue is not really fair because there's a lot. There's like cantrips, <laughs> yeah. counter spells, you'll, you'll play all those you can get. But the big thing is your blue deck, you're going to sabotage yourself if you draft too many win conditions. Whereas yeah. for your red and white aggressive decks, they're going to take as many one mana creatures with power and toughness as they can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I think that you can probably look. Okay, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back in the wayback machine to twenty episodes ago. Uh, you had talked about putting together one of your tuberts, where you just like put together what like each archetype would kind of each deck would look like if it was like successfully drafting like that archetype within your cube. And I think if you can visualize that and identify, it's like, well, what is the theme that makes this deck as good as it can be? Uh, like you said, for, okay, so for uh, controlling blue decks, uh, having as much velocity in like cantrips as you can possibly have, having as much, uh, you know, effective attackers at one and two mana for aggressive decks, having as much, as many two for ones or, uh, you know, planeswalker type cards for for mid range decks, and and we're you know these are very broad things, but uh, it when it, it breaks down across archetype lines, you can start to identify some specific cards or maybe like specific groups of cards for each of those color combinations or archetypes individually. Right, uh, one mana mana dorks for the green decks. There's, there's just something that you'll basically take as much of as you can get. And you do eventually need to identify the other stuff you need. Um, there's a point where you try to wheel them because once you have three or four of a kind of card, you don't expect anybody else's drafting it. But, but early on, the kind of cards that uh, you'll be looking for when you are trying to solidify yourself in a specific archetype are either those massively archetype defining cards like Crater of Behemoth, which is night and day for the decks that play it, or just the cards that you will just play as many as you can get for a specific strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have kind of, I think when we were talking uh, prior to the podcast, we we're talking about cards that are more flexible in their roles versus cards that are more rigid in their roles yes um so that, that's a big part of going from when you are drafting cards to when you're drafting a deck you know pack one pick one it is often good as we discussed at length last week to take something that's a little bit more flexible that has a high rate of play as, yes. as you would put it and you get to a point where you say okay i'm reading the signals i have my fetch lands or i have my cantrips, and then there's a card that makes me think I want to play a specific kind of deck. You know, even 
even in your fetch land ponder deck, there's different natures of the blue deck. Maybe you're a tempo deck, maybe you're a controlling deck, maybe you're even with a controlling deck, you could be a permissive deck or you could be a tap out deck. That's a pretty significant distinction for blue decks and high powered cubes. And it's decision time because you run into a pick that's between something like Jace Friends Prodigy that uses some mana on your turn. Maybe Jace the Mind Sculptor is actually a better example of what I'm yeah. describing. Yeah, I was actually going to say that exact thing mm -hmm. with the point you're getting at. But go ahead. Yeah. Okay, between Jace the Mind Sculptor and then something like a Mana Leak. And the Mana Leak's the kind of card where a blue deck, whether you're tempo or controlling, you'll, you'll play as many counter spells really as you realistically can get in these cubes. They're not passed too often. You can't really flood on them unless you're at a point in the game where you're behind and you only play so many cards that catch up anyway. Whereas Jace the Mind Sculptor is like, okay, my, my deck wants to spend mana on its turn. You know, that, that card used to be just like one of the best things that you could do. It's still very powerful, but these days the cost of tapping four mana at sorcery speed is a bigger indicator of what your deck is up to. Like that, yeah, that is a real cost. Yes, especially on curve. Uh, because if you're tapping out on turn four for Jace, like I think, you know, 10 years ago, that was basically equivalent of you get to choose how you get to win the game. Uh, but now it's like, well, a, a lot of other colors and other uh, strategies can play an almost equally as powerful card on turn four. So if you are willing to commit your Jace to the board and say, I don't care what you play, uh, you know, you have to be able to, I guess you have to be able to live with that decision from a, a deck perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's generally better to continue down that path of saying, well, if, if my plan is to play Jace on turn four, then I should probably tap out and play something on turn five and also on turn six, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, versus trying to be reactive with a more flexible card like a mana leak or a a remand or maybe a loose focus. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, uh, but that is, I I, I don't want to oversimplify this, but it, I'm going to come back to something that we've talked about maybe more than anything else in that show on this show, and that is I think. In most cases, when you look at cards to determine their kind of flexibility, I think a lot of time it truly comes down to how many pips is in a card. That I, definitely matters in a big way. Yeah. Uh, and it's not like that's not a hard and fast rule, but I, I think if you lined up all of the cards and you just said these are cards with a single pip of mana and these are cards or well, a single pip of color and these are cards with two pips of color. Like you're going to have a pretty distinct line of like, these are the more flexible cards. These are the more uh, rigidly defined or specific cards. And, you know, like I said, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I, I think that there is a lot of validity to, to looking at it from that perspective of how easy is this to cast if I'm in a two color deck on time uh, or maybe alongside something later in the game and still be able to cast it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it comes down to. I don't know if people prefer recurring examples of a similar nature or like a broader range of things. So I'm going to do a little column A, a little column B on this All right, next I love one. It. Let's say that you start your draft with uh, a new big hit from Modern Horizons 2, Raghavan Nimble Pilferer. Mm -hmm. And then your pack two, or pack one pick two is Lightning Bolt. So now you have two red cards that are very good in aggressive or controlling decks. And then pack one pick three, you're looking at Let's say you're really lucky, and your choices are Scalding Tarn, Ponder, Eidolon of the Great Revel. Oh boy. This is a big time decision point, right? Because yeah. Eidolon, like you said, is heavy on pips, very rigid card. If you take that, you are mono red aggro. You have good bones for it. Raghavan, Lightning Bolt, great in that deck. However, that's a deck that relies on a high volume of specific cards. So far, so good. You would have pack one. Pick one through three great cards for the deck, but you also have this option of a mana fixer and a card that you're going to play in any deck that can cast it that's not hard to cast. So these are all really inviting options, and at that point, you're basically saying, okay, do I want to be flexible and just try to draft whatever the best Raghavan is deck is, or 
do I want to take this opportunity and try to shoot the moon, as it were? Am I going to try to draft the best mono red deck possible? So I want to I want to come back to your your point of the comparison between uh, Eidolon versus Ponder versus Scalding Tarn. I believe was your the card the card you had outlined, right? Yep, that's the spread. <laughs> All right. So when we are drafting. You've identified an archetype. Uh, And this is not necessarily the same as forcing your archetype, but there's going to be times when you see a card in a draft that is the very specific card that you want for your deck to function. But it's not like a... Maybe it's not one of the best cards in your deck. Which is kind of where I put Eidolon if you're drafting a red deck. I generally think that card is very good, but it's not in like. It's often not in the top five cards. Eh, maybe that's not true. Eh, it's probably not in the top three cards, I'll say, if you're drafting a mono red deck. But it is a card that is often uh, a very isolated uh, point in your cube. There's not any other card that's going to do that. I doubt you're going to have Pyrostatic Pillar in your cube. <laughs> uh, even though that is obviously less pip intensive. Um, but you're like, the, the way that I have constructed this deck, this card is perfect for this deck. I don't really want to draft this card with my first pick, especially when I could be drafting uh, Scalding Tarn for this deck that I want to turn into a mono red deck. But in those situations, situations what, I have, what I have written down, which Ryan, uh, Ryan was like, what are you talking about? Before the podcast started, I'm calling uh, Get Your Man. And this is the time that I would just say, I need to draft this Eidolon because this is going to be important enough to my deck that I don't want to risk passing this because I don't know if this is going to come back around. It might not be as good of a card, and I'm putting air quotes around that, as good of a card as Scalding Tarn. Scalding Tarn is probably going to be quite effective um, in, in more decks than you know, the nylon. Mm. Uh, but this is the time when you just need to say, it doesn't matter if I normally would pick this fifth or sixth. I'm seeing it here. I need to go ahead and get it. And get your man is a term that it's not the term, the term that I'm coined, but if you're, if you're uh, a fantasy football player, I'm a retired fantasy football player, by the way. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, but it's something that was is frequently talked about in fantasy football. If you have someone that is on your board, uh, that you have a chance to draft, but it's a, maybe a little too early, like a little too early for when you were prepared to draft them. You were going to try to get them later, but you're not sure if you can get them on the wheel around. Just get that player. Just get the player that you wanted to that you wanted to pick for the construction of your team, even if it's too early. And I think that that suggestion can be tied a lot to cube drafting because of the independent singular card nature of the format that we're talking about. And the fact that decks are often constructed like in a very specific way on like hinges of, of specific cards. And sometimes those cards aren't like wide archetype spanning cards like Eidolon. Like that's that card's not going to go in like a ton of different decks. Mm -hmm. So in general, it is going to be a significantly more rigid card compared to the flexibility of all of the other cards that we were talking about in the context here. But yeah. when you are faced with that decision, I think it is, it is like critically important to say, this is, I just need to get this card, even in the face of potentially passing up a quote-unquote better card. And the line that I would draw there is, Eidolon is I, I don't think Eidolon is an example of this. I think that the very best mono red aggressive decks may or may not have Eidolon on the Great Rebel, and I don't think that it is necessary. Um, it, it, it's in range. It does do some things. For example, the red deck is typically slower than Storm, but Eidolon is a card that they realistically can't beat for most configurations of that. So you open up some wins you wouldn't otherwise have. There's some value there, but the rigid cards that I would definitely value highly, especially if it's an archetype that I think is very good in the metagame or that I think I have a good shot at based on the pack I open, certainly relative to what else is in the pack, is I'm looking for a card that 
is always in the best version of a deck. If if I'm drafting this archetype and I don't have this card, I am going to be on average worse than decks that do. All other things being equal, I will be worse. And an example of that, green green, Rafelos, Lanor, Emissary. If your mono green deck has that, you're off to the races. Gaia's Cradle, very much the same in that deck, where those are your big mana engines. They're what make you tick. The top end's going to be Crater of Behemoth. The perfect storm is you have all of these. Your best green decks will have all of them. But these cards are mostly looking for something very specific. The most rigid of them is Rafalos. But it's also the card yeah. that kind of most easily lets you go forest, forest. All right, whatever comes after this on turn three is going to be a problem because it's going to be so far ahead of schedule. And then there's a similar card that I think really highlights the point that I'm making is Circle of Dreams Druid. That's another card that really only goes in the heavy forest creature deck. You know, green, 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 2-1, tap for green <laughs> yeah. for every creature you control. And that card, I will play it. I, I imagine that I end up playing it even in the best versions of that archetype. However, it's not the card that makes or breaks it. If I don't have it, that's fine. It costs three and it's hard to cast. And it does only go in that deck. Oh, that is definitely true. Talk about gre- three green pips. Now, I will slightly refute your point about Guy's Cradle because Guy's Cradle is quite different than Rofalos. Rofalos, you need to be in a forest heavy deck, so it is it is a very rigid card. Mm-hmm. Guy's Cradle, people look at it and they're like, oh, this is a green card. And that's like, no, this is a card that just makes a lot of mana if you have creatures. It actually doesn't care what color creatures you have. Yeah, Cradle is absolutely uh, more flexible. Like, it's not close. Uh, yeah, comparison yeah, it's is not. not there. I only yes. brought it up because it is a card where you just take two green decks and one has Gaia's Cradle. The Gaia's Cradle deck will typically be much more powerful. Yeah, I would, I would be shocked if it was, I mean, you know, maybe not 100% of the time, but it's going to be a high percentage. It's certainly going to be heavily favored toward the Gaia's Cradle. Yeah, you're looking yeah. at a few other factors. Like, basically, it has to be cradle deck without crater of behemoth versus deck that has a lot of other mana fixing and crater of behemoth like you're, yeah. you're literally only looking at the other cards that you would never cut from the best version of the deck yeah exactly which is kind of brings me to another point i think rofalos is the single best card if you don't include cradle because cradle is the best card in most decks that it's in rofalos is the single best card in a mono green deck i think i think hands down that is the case and i don't think that Eidolon of the Great Revel is the best card in a mono red deck. Mm-hmm. So I think those those are all slightly inadequate. Uh, and maybe I am valuing the more flexible cards for a mono red deck. Uh, and maybe I'm not putting as much respect on Eidolon's name as I should be. Or maybe I'm not as worried about Storm as you are. I was just saying that's a reason to value the card, and if those things okay. were on your radar, I specifically said that Rafelos is way more important and more powerful in, in the green yes. deck. Okay, that's fair. But I, I think that when you're to to get to go back to the kind of the greater point that I was trying to make off of your point is, I think that it's important when you identify whatever card that is. You're like, this is the specific card I need for my deck. I normally would get this. You know, no one else is interested in drafting this. Like, I could feel like I could get this sixth or seventh pick. But it, here it is, you know, in pack two, pick one. I think you just, in most cases, you just need to draft that card. Even if it is over a card that is on average going to be a more powerful card. If it is a a very specific effect that's in a cube that's not redundant, uh, that is going to make your deck better, even at the cost of potentially picking a a card that is on average better against, you know, or better for most other decks. Uh, even when you have a chance to wield that, I, I have a, I have a hard a hard time trying to do that because when you get, to, I, I feel like around when you fuck around and try to get fancy and wheel something, you just feel really dumb when it comes back around. And you're like, oh, I guess I didn't wheel it. Yes, I guess someone picked it seventh or eighth. Because that's when you're. That's when this card generally gets picked, and I just really needed this card for my deck, and I picked a card that now I'm less happy with. Yeah, I will. Because I wanted to get both. I will take those gambles when it's 
a card that's maybe a little bit above replacement level and I'd like to have it, but there's something fundamental that I'm kind of missing. You know, I'll, I'll take a land over the upper half of like three mana cards from my Soul Tie deck. I'll probably take like Ashiok or Oko over the land. That that's gonna be your get your man there. But like I'm gonna take yeah. the underground C over like Tireless Tracker, which is above replacement level, but like yeah. I gotta cast my spells. Yeah, um, that's a good example, actually. I think that's a good example because Tireless Tracker is a pretty powerful card, but like you know, underground C is like a, a critical component. Right. But generally, if if you're looking at a card and Ashiok Oko, this might be the case for them, but if you're looking at a card and Upon drafting it, it is the best card you have drafted so far. It is a card most likely to individually carry you to game wins. Uh, context agnostic. I can't justify passing that. Yeah, yeah. And and I think and I think those are the those are the situations that I don't know. I think those cards are all like quite quite powerful and maybe i'm just not doing a good job of illustrating like the group of card although i think tireless tracker versus underground sea is actually a very good comparison um in those those particular cases now a lot of times a lot of times to get your man is to get a land yes like that and honestly i would say more often than not uh it is get a land it's in pack three you open watery grave and you don't have fixing yet and you have a I don't know, a, a Jace Friends Prodigy, but you already have uh, 18 playables in your deck. You know, <laughs> probably time to draft that Watery Grave yeah, instead the, of the uh, Jace Friends Prodigy. The three or more color decks, first you have to figure out who your man is, then you have to get your man. You know, <laughs> yes. Am I missing yes. lands? That is, that is, am I missing yeah, that's an important first point. Yeah, am I missing just role players? Whereas mm-hmm. if, if you're in mono white aggro and you open up palest jailer that card's deranged just just draft it like i don't i don't (laughs) care if mono white seems open everyone's looking for that somebody might hate draft it it's kind of uncouth i don't condone hate drafting in cube but like i mean it's gonna happen sometimes that card's really powerful (laughs) yeah they'll they'll go out of the someone will go out of their way to play it (laughs) like i'm just saying there's plenty of reasons you won't get it back yes yes for sure yeah yeah I think that's an important, I guess that's an important note. Maybe we skip that portion of like <laughs> the getting your man is, is good to do, but you have to identify what that is first. And it's not, you can't like pre identify that before the draft because the context of the draft and what, what has come up uh, by the time the second half, second part of the draft comes around, uh, that's going to be when it's more important to take the time to say, okay, is this my only shot to get this? Will I see another card like this? Uh, and, you know, going into pack one, you don't have any, any idea what that's going to be because not only do you not know ultimately what deck you're going to be drafting, even if you're forcing an archetype, although if you're forcing an archetype, maybe you could have this kind of in the back of your mind ahead of time. Uh, but this is this is the kind of your, the critical moments in your draft where you have to just sit down and say, all right, well, I just have to draft this card. There might be a, a more flexible card in my deck that's, uh, you know, that's going to be I don't want to say more powerful, but more more objectively powerful. But for this deck, I need to have this card drafted. Uh, to, uh, in most cases, like I said, I don't like to mess around. I don't like to mess around and pass those. Just yep. draft the cards that you need, even if you feel like you can get them later. The least fun you can have in a game of Magic is when your deck doesn't function. And there's plenty of ways in a cube draft where you can make a pick that makes that your fault. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a that's a very bad feeling. Uh, and I'll take this point again. As we talked about last week, we're all we're touching on lands. And I promise you that that discussion is coming uh, very soon. Well, but by the time by the time you get through the end of the next month, you're going to be sick of us talking about lands. So <laughs> I appreciate your patience in the in the time currently where you're hearing us mention lands and you're thinking, man. These guys are really dumb. They just don't even like to draft lands. No, I promise that we do. Uh, We like it so much that we'll be talking about it for multiple episodes. Anyway. uh, Okay, so where do we want to go from here? What what are we missing for 
for kind of uh, identifying specific card roles. I think the last big note to touch on is proactive versus reactive cards and finding the right balance. Mid-range decks, oftentimes, this is pretty reductive, but just whatever is on average the most powerful card. Whether your deck wants Coligan's Command or some Planeswalker, this is a weird example based on the colors of the cards, but like Gideon Allies and a car. You'll, you'll take one or the other based off of castability, and you'll have some combination of proactive and reactive. You just kind of need your deck to function. But your aggressive deck, you need enough reaction to ensure that you have meaningful points of interaction against the expected metagame. You know, your mono-red aggressive deck is going to want to be able to bolt the bird, for example. You want to try to keep the field clear of opposing planeswalkers that can snowball in value. Whereas your controlling decks, they're going to need some proactive cards, but just a little bit. That's a point I mentioned earlier. You can definitely draft too many win conditions. And in fact, I would say that that is more likely than an aggressive deck having too many reactive cards. It's a controlling deck having too many of the wrong proactive cards. When they're cheap, it's fine because you get them online quickly. There's a chance your opponent's not set up and then your, your Ashiok can run away with the game. Your Oko can run away with the game. But when your hand just has three six drops in it, they got to be really damn good. And you got to get to them on time if they're going to have a meaningful impact on the game. Yeah. Yeah, I actually agree with all of that. I don't have any, any refuting points for, for anything you just said. Got away with one. I was waiting. I was like, I'm going to try to get <laughs> him on something. When is he going to blow this? No, no, no. I think that is... Uh, I, I completely agree with that. I think the most, the most frequent thing I see is uh people having a disparity of a certain type of card in their deck and then they just draw them all yep it could be anything and the biggest the biggest one is like you have too many win conditions in your control deck it's like yeah but all your win conditions cost like four five and six and i've played cards for the first three turns and you sat there waiting to play your your gideon allies in the car and it's too late uh and i think that that is and, and Gideon is is one of the cheaper ones, generally for a control deck, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to something even if like a, you know, like a Elspeth Suns champion. And you got to just think like you, you have, you're going to have to compete at all at all phases of the game. So identifying like what the role of your deck is, and I don't want to go into like a, you know, a limited focused who's the beat down discussion here, but ultimately. Uh, knowing what your deck's goal is and the critical points that you're going to need to interact with your compo- with your opponent, or if your interaction is putting the threat in play and making them do something about it, uh, it's it's very easy to draft too many of too many cards that don't go for that specific goal, um, and not enough of the ones that can get you to the point in the game where you're in position to win. Yep, and just boiling that down, the the beatdown deck. Your role, get the opponent dead. The control yeah. deck, your role, stay alive. <laughs> Win somehow. Yeah. It is better to have one, maybe two resilient ways to close the game than to have fine, five okay ones. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I, I don't think I have anything else to add on this topic, this particular portion of the topic, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, there's some good notes here. Okay. All right, in that case, uh, we're going to take our last break for the ads, and we will be back in just a moment. Have some extra cards laying around that you want to get rid of? Go to StarCityGames.com slash sell. It has never been easier to turn your cards into cash, or if you're looking to outfit your cube or commander deck with some new favorites, get a 30% trade-in bonus when you choose store credit. No matter what your collection looks like, we have a method for you. Want to see exactly what every card you have is worth? Check out our buy list. Don't have time for that? Stick it all in a box. Send it to us, and we'll make you an offer with our ship and sell program. Or if you want a more personal touch, make your way to the Star City Game Center in Roanoke, Virginia to sit down with a buyer just like the old days. With the fastest turnaround time in the industry, Get an offer in under four days when you go to starcitygame.com slash sell. 
selling has never been easier. What's up, gamers? Taking a break from the pod here to talk to you about Star City Games Premium. Now, I know many of you are already premium members. That's awesome. You're awesome. Thank you for that. If you are not already enrolled in SCG Premium, we need to talk. You are leaving a value on the table for $7.99 a month. You get access to 5% off of Magic Sealed product, 10% off of all Magic singles, 15% off of supplies. Now, I know that I'm talking to a lot of cube owners here. I know that you're going to buy more sleeves. You know you are going to save this money right back on sleeves alone. So that's reason enough for you to enroll. But I am not done yet, not by a long shot. You also get tons of exclusive content from a fantastic stable of writers. We're talking about Jerry Thompson, Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa, Patrick Sullivan, Autumn Burchett, Brad Nelson, Sheldon Menry, Ross Miriam, Todd Anderson, Shaheen Sarani, Michael Majors, Ryan Sachs, Ari Lax, Dominic Harvey, Cedric Phillips. The list goes on and on. My stuff, you can get that every week for free. You're welcome. But now I am asking a favor. Go ahead, get enrolled for SCG Premium. Go to starcitygames.com slash join hyphen premium. Sign up today and let's get back to the podcast. All right, for the uh, closeout here, this is kind of where we're putting, I guess, the notes that we didn't, that we couldn't cleanly fit into any of the segments on this episode or the last episode. So, Ryan, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'll start this show, right. rather this segment of this episode. Um, the big note I want to touch on when it comes to building a deck and this is just a really good fundamental piece of magic deck building advice. Pay a lot of attention to your mana curve, both with the deck you're drafting and of the cube that you're drafting from. If you're drafting an aggressive deck, you want all those one drops. You'll play as many as you can get. You haven't been doing that, and like, it's not because you have a very good reason. You consider just, just starting to do that. Don't end up with too many four drops. Don't end up with too many five drops because those cards getting stuck in your hand, that's how you're going to lose to your opponent just doing anything. You got to close the game quickly. Cheap spells are the best way to do that. If you're controlling decks, make sure you're doing something early. Have that high volume interaction. Make sure you're lean on the top end. You're lean on the win conditions. You're actually casting spells every turn of the game ideally getting to a point where you're casting two spells a turn because you have to make up for the fact that your opponent was probably on offense for a good chunk at the beginning of the game. And then a really important note here, when it comes to knowing the mana curve of the cube, is knowing where the archetype that you're drafting is likely to get glutted. The reason mm -hmm. you take so many one-drops for the mono-red or the mono-white deck is because the cube has a lot of four and five mana creatures you will, on average, get more than you want to play. You don't need to value them that highly. They are broadly interchangeable. Some of them are better than others. If you don't have any, it'll get to a point, and I think it's probably like late in pack two, where you say, okay, I would like to have a four drop just to make sure I'm doing something meaningful on turn four. That makes sense. But watch out for getting glutted there. Another big spot where the magic gun lines tend to get glutted Five mana spells for the mono green deck. They're, they're all the same. I don't care if I have mm -hmm. Elder Gargaroth, Plow Under, Nyssa who shakes the world, uh, Primal Command. I, I, the important thing is that I only have four or five of them. And the idea is that I cast them on turn three, and it's good to cast a five mana spell on turn three. It is bad to have an opening hand with five five mana spells. <laughs> yeah, although I will say I think it's a lot better to cast uh, Elder Gargaroth than than Primal Command. Oh yeah, Primal Command. I'm like, it's unfortunate that one came to mind. Deranged Hermit's a much better name. <laughs> yeah. I actually like try not to draft Primal Command almost at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a. I think that's a very good point. Like any any time. <sighs> really just for like the top of your curve and the top of your curve, I'm putting in air quotes again, because that's going to be deck dependent. The top, the top of your curve in an aggro deck could be like th three, four drops and one five drop, mm -hmm. which I think is, is probably uh, most successful aggressive decks kind of are somewhere along those lines. Uh, it doesn't, it generally doesn't matter what you end up with. 
Like they're all going to be they're all going to be very good, but they're going to be so plentiful that whichever ones you can find in the back back five cards of a single draft, you'll be able to play those and they're going to slot right in. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are kind of just your closer cards, but it doesn't really matter what they are. And when it comes to the mono white deck, the best five drop actually costs zero mana sometimes. Solitude is your man. Yeah, yeah. When we talked about how messed up that card is, but uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, But even something like, you know, I'm looking at between four and five drops, like you do want something. You do want a hero of blade hold or a uh, an angel of invention or something like that. But it doesn't matter which one you get. Right. They're all they're all going to be about the same for the context of your deck. Um and and as long as you're able to focus on the cards that people are generally generally going to be fighting over, which are the inexpensive ones, or the or in some cases the one with less pips. Well, while that doesn't have have to do with mana curve specifically, if you're playing more than a single color deck, uh, it is going to affect your curve because you're not going to be able to play a blue blue card in your soul tide deck very often mm-hmm. on turn two. Um, so the the cards that are easier to cast, whether it's from a curve related purposes or a casting ability related purposes uh based on how easy it is to cast the, i mean that's i, I think that's a, a obviously a critically important thing and this is for all limited of course uh but the reason that i think this is more important in cube is because again all of the cards are good yes that's a big difference there's been some conversations on twitter about two drops in regular booster draft and yeah when they're grizzly bears you can have too many that that yeah. makes sense. When they're robber of the rich and Tarmogoyf, I guess there's a theoretical limit, but you're not going to hit it. Yeah, usually not. I'm trying to think what a deck would have to look like. You'd have to have all. You'd have to have all two drops and no one drops. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You do need it'd the be one something drops. Something weird. So that yeah, has to be something weird like the aggressive decks. Yeah, that, that's yeah. A, another big difference between traditional limited and and cube draft. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I think uh, I think mana curve is a, a critical component. Um, so the question that I kind of want to pose, uh, you know, what do we do when? I guess what do you, what do you do? I, I will state mine first, but I'll, I want to get your thought on this too, Ryan. You know, what does what does a person do when you open a pack and you have a huge amount of cards of a single color? You open a pack and there's seven blue cards in it and it is possible to open a pack with seven blue cards even if you've shuffled your cube appropriately Mm -hmm. i don't want to try to shame anyone shuffle shame anyone uh it is possible for that to happen or uh if you have uh open a pack and there's a single blue card and let's say those are the cards you want to draft how much stock do you put into uh saying well do I want to stay out of blue because there's so many blue cards here because that's going to be sending bad signals because uh, of the top five cards in this pack, three of them are blue. Uh, is that something that you like to stay out of or do you just say this doesn't matter? Let me just jump in. Uh, I am of the opinion of uh, largely um, not worrying about what the people behind you are going to draft. In most cases, especially like early in the draft. And if the best card is a blue card, um, unless the second best card is something that's come on the completely opposite side of the spectrum, that sometimes is a consideration. But if clearly the best card is a blue card, then I'm just going to pick that blue card and uh, be willing to fight with people anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you on that best card, second best card consideration, especially if. We're talking about a vintage cube, legacy cube, and, and honestly, just a lot of cubes where blue's just the best because why wouldn't it be? I go into the draft expecting I'll have to fight you. If there's seven blue cards, there's a reasonable, reasonable bet from that pack alone I'm getting two. So mm-hmm. I'm not in a bad position if that's what's going on. And if the second best card is a lot worse, and why would I draft it? Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I do have a funny story, and this does boil down to uh, a metagame thing, a very specific metagame, but I drafted a vintage cube some years ago, 
playing with a bunch of locals who are more vintage and legacy players. And one thing you should know about vintage players, it's less true of legacy players now, but it's more true of legacy players than it is of booster draft players. Uh, they're afraid of the combat step. They have like oh, an, yeah. an allergy, like they wake up in the middle of the night thinking about going to combat and controlling a creature and having to make a decision. That, that's not for them. It's not why they play Magic. <laughs> so I was playing Vintage Cube with a bunch of Vintage players, and I opened a pack, and this was an eight-player draft, so a 15-card pack. I had no red cards. But it did have a Muta Vault. And so hey, I hey. thought, this, this is as good as red. And I just hard-forced <laughs> on Mono Red, and as I expected, none of them touched a single red card, and I just destroyed them in the draft. Yeah. I, as someone that is a, I would identify, I would identify myself as a, a an eternal uh, constructed player. Uh, Legacy is my favorite 60 card format. Uh, Vintage is probably my second favorite. Um, that characterization is 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially in Vintage, especially in Vintage. Uh, unless they are, unless someone is playing shops. And that is like what they've always played. They're not interested in combat. Yeah. I've seen so many, even in like, even in like Eternal Weekend Vintage, where it's like vintage champs. I've seen, I've, I've literally playing against so many people just being like, just not wanting to get these like little chip shots of damage in. And I'm like, all right. And this stuff adds up. You just want to hold back because you just wanted, you're like, I'm going to do my thing. Uh, yeah, they don't like attacking. <laughs> That's totally true. So uh, that just comes down to I, I worry a little bit less about what's in the literal pack that I opened than what I expect to happen next. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And the only reason I, and I think, you know, this might seem obvious to us, but I do think that there are people that open, you know, you open a pack that has a lot of the same color. And it's like, I want to avoid that because there's going to be so many people fighting over those. So maybe I'll pick something. Uh, maybe I will pick something that is uh, looks like it's going to have less competition from the rest of the table. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a non-zero amount of times that's the correct thing to do. But most of the times I'm going to take I'm going to take the best card if I feel like it's the best card and that I can build a a, a deck around that, uh, regardless if two or three other drafters are going to try to do a at least think that they're going to do a similar thing. The best decks are typically getting two cards for their deck out of more packs than not. So that's another big consideration there. If there's seven blue cards and you're looking at a green card, how many green cards are there? Like, are you yeah. going to get a card back? And what does it mean if you get this pack back and then you just take one of the worst blue cards when it comes back to you? I, I think if you are likely in that situation, just look over the pack. Just actually evaluate, evaluate the cards broadly as if the color distribution is not what it is. Just, just look at the cards. Yes. What's the rate of play? How powerful is this card? And just think about that and think about what you think is going to come back. Maybe some other people also get a little wary of trying to draft a blue card. Maybe they move in. You know, you don't necessarily know that. But just kind of think about what cards you're thinking about taking and what's going to come back. And if the answer is you're expecting one of the dumpy blue cards to come back, you may as well take a good one. Yeah. Yeah, because if you take the green card, which is the second best card, but there's no other green cards, you know what you're going to be taking on the second way back around? That same dumpy blue card. Yep. So, yeah, I agree. I, I am excited when I open a pack that has a lot because it's like, oh, man. I can take the best card here and make sure that I get something on the way back around. Yes. I, yeah. I, I, like, I like having that confidence. A guaranteed wheel is so nice. Guaranteed wheel is really good. It's really, really good. I don't care who is taking what in the middle. In fact, I will generally sit down when I open a pack and I'm like, well, what are the, what are the eight best cards in this pack? And generally, if I rank those and I can get back like, you know, my, the sixth best card in this pack that's in the same color, I'm going to be jazzed. You also get really good information about what you're looking for in that color. 
Yeah. The breakdown, yes. it's not just seven blue cards. It's seven blue cards that are for a range of archetypes, or, or maybe mm-hmm. they even all are just broadly good blue cards. But if you know that, then you know that you're getting a second role player, and you can look at the other packs and say, okay, well, what am I going to use this this ponder and that, I don't know, thirst for knowledge on the way back to sculpt the draws of? Yeah. I, I you know, another way I really value these packs is you can get a really, really good read on the draft at that ninth pick. If you just get like five of the blue cards back. <laughs> well, I mean, really, you if you if you take a kind of take an inventory of what's in this first pack um, from a color perspective, if it's like heavily slanted in one direction, you can you can kind of figure out like, well, what are people you know, what are people kind of thinking going into the, the first part of this draft. And I think it's easier to do that in a really like a high density of a single color pack than it is something that's very even because then it's just the best cards are going to be taken. Mm-hmm. And there's not going to be the disparity of, oh, I'm trying to draft this specific, specific color or stay out of this specific color. And you can really get an idea of that when you see a pack that's just got a ton of a single color card. So I think I, I like when I open those uh, and <laughs> what I, uh, you know, now, it, it does come around sometimes. Maybe you open uh, seven blue cards, but the best card is a green card. The actual best card is a green card. Uh, and, you know, that's that's not bad either. You're not going to necessarily get the wheel, but you still will get a lot of that information. And the last point about the seven blue card pack, if that's where you're starting your draft, you also have a pretty good idea and I think it's unlikely, but it might happen that a bunch of the blue cards come back on the wheel. But you get a pretty good idea that you're passing to some players in blue. And that means when you identify your second color, you know that there's a good chance you're going to be fighting these players for lands. So yeah, I think it's, it's less important. I think you should make that first pick based largely about abstract power level and what deck you're trying to draft, what you think you can wheel. But then from there, you do want to adjust your pick order. If you take the blue card, there's a good chance that you want to draft lands a little more highly, at least the blue lands, uh, once you figure out what color you want to pair with blue. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. So that is a, that's a good segue to uh, the next couple of weeks. I think that's probably a fair place to end on before yeah. we start talking about lands. More land teasers. Yeah, more land. Yeah, that's what everyone wants. Everyone just wants to hear about lands. So. <laughs> uh, so that is, that's what we'll end for today. And like, like we said, in the coming episodes, we are going to talk about lands and cube from a couple of different perspectives. But uh, we want to thank everyone for listening today. If you want to please subscribe to the 540 on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts or Amazon or Stitcher or YouTube or your local podcast app, wherever you're listening right now, or maybe you're listening uh, at a cube draft and you're like, I would like to start listening to the 540. They sound like quite pleasant gentlemen to listen to. Well, those are the places you can go on your own time uh, and listen so you don't have to listen in the bottom of somebody's basement. (laughs) Uh, Not that that's a bad thing. If you have listened and you like what you've heard, please leave us a review wherever you can. Uh, Whether it be a five-star review, a short text review, anything helps. Uh, The algorithm is a hungry beast and it likes everything it can get. Now, you can find me at jparnell1 on Twitter. You can find my other work on Commander Versus on StarCityGames.com and YouTube, as well as my other podcast, Think Twice, by searching Think Twice MTG wherever you are hearing this podcast or any of the aforementioned locations above. That's a magic and pop culture podcast. Uh, Ryan, have you seen the movie uh, The Raid Redemption? I don't think I've ever heard of that movie. I had not heard of it until very recently. Uh, it's, a, it's an action movie uh, plot not a lot there a lot of action well that's what we're going to be talking about on the podcast this week my uh, myself and Stephen Green uh, it is a, a movie that you would have thought would have been right up Stephen's alley not a I, lot of thinking a lot of punching I would expect that yeah yeah uh, anyway think twice MTG that's what you can uh, what you should search for that Ryan what you got you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Overdrive, and you can find my articles weekly on StarCityGames.com. This week should be some pretty heavy overlap with what we've been talking about on the podcast here and drafting your lane. This week's article 
uh, should be about identifying cards you expect to or can plan to wheel in a cube draft, uh, specifically with a focus on the Magic Online Vintage Cube, which is still up for a few more days uh, at the time that this is going to go live. And uh, I also have a few articles coming up. There's going to be a week of three different spotlight cubes starting next week, and I'll be doing initial breakdowns for all of those. You want to check those out if you want a quick crash crash course before you get into the Magic Online Cube Cues. You can find those weekly on StarCityGames.com and typically any updates or other musings on my Twitter at Ryan Overdrive. Love it. Thank you everyone again for listening to the 540. We got lands coming up on the next couple episodes. We'll catch you then. Mm-hmm.